two categories. So for, for our program, there's the folks that are the content owners and that provide the content to GPO. Then there are the folks that use the content, consume the content uh, through our, our public website or, or through other means. So in terms of the folks that give us content, um, whether it be congressional stakeholders or agency stakeholders that are, are um, you know, paying GPO to provide a service or uh, any of the other stakeholders that give us data, they have a certain way that they want to see that data uh, made available out to the public. So that's kind of, that's one aspect of our stakeholders. This, the other aspect is on the, the public user side. So uh, whether it be folks that are, are consuming our bulk data feeds or using the public website or researchers or any number of, of users that are consumers of the data, what a lot of the times what we find is you may have, we may have a, a requirement that comes from a data owner that's in direct conflict with how a consumer would want to, to see this data. So a lot of, a lot of it is, is going back and forth between those two sides, between your, your producers and your consumers, and letting them know what the other one thinks. Because a lot of times you have your, your two different user communities are, are very separate. And a lot of what I do is, is going back and forth between those user communities. You know, in addition to that, we have a number of, of internal stakeholders that a, a lot of it is communication, it's setting up expectations, it's agreeing upon a, a clear scope for your project. I agree that it's not over-promising. That's, that's the, as much as you want to say yes to, to everything that a person re or an organization requests of you, you can't do it. At least that's my, uh, my uh, opinion of it. Um, you have to know when to say, we can accomplish this in this time frame for this budget, and then let's look at accomplishing your additional requirements. So a lot of it is communication and setting up those clear expectations and, and clear scope of, of what you want to deliver. Maybe that's something that everybody has to learn the hard way. I mean, I, it would be nice if, like, I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? Can you give some examples of ticketing programs that you use, and also speak more about the value of the project management certification? I'll start with ticketing systems. So uh, starting sort of oldest first, um, OTRS, RT, uh, RT morphed into a product called Hivelander, uh, used Bugzilla and its variants and precursors, used ClearCase and ClearQuest at some point. Um, at the Library of Congress, we use, uh, have used a couple of different systems, but are currently using uh, Jira, Footprints, Track, uh, all, all in various contexts. I've used Mantis, um, which is a, a has a very good querying interface. Pro probably of all these that I've mentioned so far, Track has been kind of my, my favorite. Uh, so on open source projects, it's become common for the, the code hosting platform to have their own. So GitHub's ticketing system that comes along with it is what we use for a big project that I manage now. Um, which is very much like Track. Um, Codeplex and Google Code have similar ones that are not, that are um, just built built in with the service. Um, I've used a Roll Your Own. Uh, I've used Microsoft Excel. Um, I think when we've, uh, when I've done, um, been working on projects where um, there was a lot of virtual collaboration, I've used the, the products from 37 Signals, many of which have some ticketing capacity built into them, but um, obviously Basecamp is the, the kind of project managing one. Um, I have used just desktop products that, uh, that um, like Re Remedy with a desktop client, as well as Remedy with a, with a, a, a web client. Um, other desktop products, like uh, I, I've, I've used from start to finish on a project, uh, Microsoft Project, that's been close to 15 years since, since that happened. Um, there was a Microsoft project knockoff called Mr. Project that was an open source project that I used a few times. Right. Yeah. Um, I, did I mention OTRS already, which is kind of more call center uh, management. Um, those are the ones just off the top of my head. I've, I've, uh, I've made a good list before, um, and uh, but 
my, my experience has been other than the um, products that are really hateful for some particular reason. So examples of uh, how things would be very hateful. Oh, Pivotal Tracker is another one I've used. Um, uh, examples would be that they force you to call tickets something other than a ticket. Um, they fail to integrate with anything else that isn't them. Um, they force you to use a desktop client that may or may not run on your desktop. I've had ticketing systems where I literally had to use a different, so I, I, I set it a Linux system and I had to use a different computer to even look at the ticketing system. Um, but other than the sort of maybe 40% of ticketing systems that have something really hateful about them, they're all roughly okay with me. So we, we currently use uh, ClearQuest, and we're in the process of doing a migration from ClearQuest to Footprints that needs to be completed by the end of September. And we just kind of, we're in the initial part of, of setting up the schema and Footprints. So I will let you know how that goes. It's, it, I, it looks promising. There's a lot of, of um, there are a lot of things that are hard to, there's not enough flexibility within in ClearQuest for my team. Footprints looks like it has more flexibility, so I, I think that's going to be pretty promising for us. I, I'm an unabashed fan. Sorry, can I, can I go in there? I'm an unabashed fan of GitHub. Uh, I've used some fraction of other things you've heard mentioned, um, but these days, what I find about GitHub is not only does it help us um, accomplish our software development tasks the way we want to accomplish them, but it it self models the behavior I aspire for us to embody. Uh, we are getting better as a software development team by using more of GitHub's available features. We're, I said we're a small team before, but we, uh, I realized a while ago, maybe I can segue into this, pick up from there, that uh, on our team we weren't talking to each other enough about the code we were working on. So I, I wanted to try two techniques to get us to talk to each other more about code. Because you'd end up with two people working on the same project, working in similar files on similar tasks, and they would never sync up about their goal, and they'd name things differently, you know, all the things that can go wrong, um, even though they sat a few feet from each other. You know, these are very, uh, people who come in and uh, have a very sincere approach to their work just were not in the habit of discussing something before they went to work on it. So uh, we've instituted reviewing code code reviews, and we've instituted code reading, which are separate. Um, and code reviews take two forms. One is the sort of more traditional sit in a room and somebody shows off their code and you all throw darts at it. Um, friendly darts. Uh, and, but more specifically, we review each other's code by using Git uh, patches through the GitHub pull request mechanism. They make it so unbelievably easy to do this that now on every one of our active projects, or there's one or two more that I think we're not doing yet, that we should start with, we always, rather than committing our code, we uh, commit a branch, submit a pull request, and one other person has to review it and maybe talk it over with you, whatever, before they commit it. And the other person does the committing and the integrating. Uh, and this, I think, has really helped us not only make sure that you've got two people who understand decisions that were made, but also have two people that can solve a problem instead of just one if something comes up and the other person's away. This is really critical on a small team, but it also models the kind of behavior that software companies and independent software developers all over the world have found to be best practices in the free Libra open source community. We thought dentistry wasn't going to come up again. There's floss for you. Um, uh, I felt nice. flat. Uh, Two of us left. Uh, the, um, the broader software community works this way. Git came from Linus Torvalds wanting a better way to manage patches, and that's why Git works so great. And GitHub evolved as a social network around people and code, uh, and people wanting to share code. And uh, it's actually led us to think about new things, like what Aaron's doing at the Kirk Cure, where they're putting all their metadata on GitHub. Sorry, I hope I didn't blow your question. But um, the other thing we're doing now, and I'll say it quickly and maybe get to your question, is that uh, we are sitting around in a room and reading other people's code together. Once a week on Wednesdays at 3, we cancel today because so many of us are here. 
uh, we pull up some code. We spent a couple of weeks reading uh, bagit.py, and we've looked at mark.py, and we've looked at uh, the Rails Bento app that Jonathan Rockkind at Hopkins wrote, and a handful of other things. And we take a few weeks to just step through the code and talk about how it works. And for people who are in the room who are not on our team, non-developers, who are interested in this work, we are creating a culture in which we are comfortable and used to talking to each other about code. And we answer basic computer science questions that come up, but also we dive deep into things like metadata issues. And if Jackie Shea, who's here somewhere, if not in this room, then nearby, is in the room, then if some complicated question about AACR rules comes up, then we can have a good argument about metadata rules. Um, and that allows us to engage her more in her work. And uh, I, I don't know that this has spread widely enough yet, but it's been really a constructive way to engage our colleagues in looking at code. I'm guessing David wants to say I just want to say, before we let Aaron take the mic, uh, we do our code reads completely different, uh, differently than Dan's just described, um, because we do them on Wednesdays at 9.30. And that'll never work. Yeah. That'll never work. <laughs> but uh, other than that, uh, this is a suggestion that, that Dan had been doing it for some months, and we were having breakfast one day, and he said, you know, we're doing this thing. And it, I, I think our very first one was a home run, and it's been really fun. And they they had one today without the the bunch of us that are here, and I think it it, it went well too. And I, um, but I I just want to say thank you for that. Yeah. And uh, and it, it, and it's um, we kind of set out to just do it over the summer. Uh, you know, it's kind of a funny time for all of us. I think the sum, summertime and a, a little bit. Um, change of routine, and that's been a really nice, um, and we do it exactly as he described, except for that one major caveat that we do it in the morning instead of the afternoon. Yeah, just one scale. Yeah. One scale. Yeah. Um, so I had a question that is probably a bit unfair and I think I have the answer to, which, which and there was an observation before, which is, so the question is, you're talking about GitHub, and it's clear, like, GitHub is bar none doing the best work. But, uh, sorry, Government Digital Services in the UK. But got no. what, what, what's it called? Government Digital Services. It's often just referred to as GES. Uh, but that's, you know, it's amazing stuff, but that's a separate issue. All right. Um, but the, the thing about GitHub is they make a point of, of telling people they have no project management. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, None. Yeah. Uh, and so it's kind of apples and oranges. But the observation from, from listening to having worked in the startup world, from having done client services, from now being in the museum world, is what you guys are describing sounds a whole lot like a client services model. And the problem with that, and we have this all the time, when I worked at a design studio, is people would come back to us and be like, seriously, you're not paying us any more money. Like, we're not working on this anymore. And I'm just curious like, how you guys deal with, with that issue, because I think there, it, it feels like there's still this sense that the software is just kind of this other box over there. And it's not really part of what people like. People don't think about it as part of what they do. Yeah, uh, I think actually, I'm, I'm gonna do this whole panel on service and just ask Aaron if he can come take my chair for a little while. <laughs> I think that's a really good point. Yeah, I think the more that we can get people to think about software as something they are doing, the happier everyone in the world will be. Uh, I, I, I think, um, I think about people that I've been working with for now over six years um, who will still ask me questions that I have enabled them to answer for themselves maybe five years ago uh, because of that mindset. Um, you know, you know uh, it, it feels like ice skating uphill sometimes, sort of getting people to realize that this is not an IT function. This is your organization. This is what you do now. You know, I, when I did my little lightning talk yesterday, uh, I, I, you know, I, I rattled off a list of organizations that I think are software companies, uh, you know, Weight Watchers, Ford Motor Company, uh, the NSA, right? That 
it's part of what a, an organization in the world now um, participates in. It's a core function. Um, sort of knowing about software is the same as, you know, as once upon a time uh, was the same as, you know, knowing how to use a telephone or knowing how to go to a meeting, knowing how, shoot, I don't even know what people did before they made software. So somebody else can come up with a good example. Actually, I'm going to add on to, to that. So I think it's so, it's so critical for folks to have that understanding. Here's an example. When we recently hired a, a number of folks in my organization and they came on board and, and it's almost it's it's almost like an expectation that even though we're a program management office, the expectation is that you will either already come in understanding or you'll quickly acquire the knowledge of how to manage software development. That this is this is what we do. That if I, you know, say check out this XML file and tell me what this attribute is and if it matches this, that they have that knowledge and, and that understanding. That it's there's no real the projects that we manage are almost all software development for IT related projects. So I guess there are some, I think there was a project um, to see if we could put a gym in the GPO building. So that was a non-software one. We, at least we couldn't really find a, a touch point on that one. But <laughs> almost everything that flows through our program management office has a, has a touch point with that software development. And it's getting the folks on the team to understand that and then also communicating it out to the management levels and the executive that this is what we do now. I think in the same way that the core product for Weight Watchers right now is a web app and an iPhone app, a, a lot of the users that we serve in our institutions are coming, like they're not walking through the door, right? They're coming to the website. And that's why like we really need to think of software development as a core function of our institutions. Do you want to time to respond to Eric? Well, I want to respond to Eric. Okay. <laughs> I, I think I heard you say something else that I wanted to weigh in on because you, you, you sort of threw away the comment you're not paying us anymore, so we're still not going to work on that anymore. We have two types of projects in all of our organizations, ones that end and ones that never end. And, and this is something that, that we then end up building into our team's core operational budget because you know this is something that becomes a core service at the library. We end up owning it, and we will be running this service forever and we'll be doing software development on it forever. So when David said we had 25 projects that have been chartered, 10 of which we're still running, some of them will run for a certain number of years because they do go with a certain amount of funding, but some of them will literally never end and we will always be doing software development on those projects. And we have to build that into how we manage our projects, that they'll be the ones we can say, okay, we know someone's going to be working on this one for six months or a year or two years, and then it'll end, and okay, we have some people that are going to be working on this forever. How do we actually rotate people through this so nobody goes crazy, nobody quits, nobody kills us, we don't kill anyone else, and keep the service going and keep the software development going in a way that doesn't you know, ruin the product. So it, it's it's funny because I, I, uh, I, I still have a uh, beat up old Library of Congress hat I can put on and I can hear what David and Leslie are saying and nod my head. But what you're describing, Aaron, is a problem, is a new good problem I would love for us to have. I would like to have so many people happy with what we're doing that they keep coming back and asking us for more. Uh, I think I think Kareem would be happy to have that problem as well. And then that's really easy to make the case that we need to have more people to do more of it. Um, and then we can address it when it becomes the kind the, the, the problem with the tone you're describing. Um, for me, it's a goal uh, to actually get there. Um, uh, additionally, uh, I think there are a lot of things that you can do as an, as an experienced software developer and as a software developer, sorry to get all sort of back on topic, I don't know, but um, <laughs> as a software project manager, to uh, make things more sustainable. Uh, there is, a, now everybody has an opinion, of course, about tools and techniques, but I think there are a set of approaches you can take to how you build your software that can make things less expensive to maintain over time. We are very keen on using commodity, free software libraries and tools for which we could hire almost anybody with some of that kind of common experience, for which there are thousands and thousands and thousands of developers worldwide 
that could come in, see, oh, you're doing this with Django and Python and Postgres and you use Git and GitHub and uh, you, you know, you're managing your builds with Travis and you're deploying software with Fabric. Right, yeah, I know all that. I'm a Python developer. That's what a lot of us do. Um, the, the barrier to add people to the project needs to be low. The ongoing cost of supporting the project is low. One of the things GitHub does beautifully, and I just wanted to say also that I, I admire everything that company does, both internally and external. Kareem, I think, is tired of hearing me say that I wish our library were less of a sort of traditional hierarchy and more of a flat company like uh, GitHub. Uh, everybody deploys to production all the time at GitHub, and it's all automated, and it blows my mind. And we're actually steadily working toward that. I see Salim nodding. Um, the, uh, we want to do what you guys are doing, where we've automated deployment. So every step in the process gets cheaper and more reliable. So that when we need to make a change, you can focus all your energy on the change you need to make to meet somebody's new needs. Uh, and the rest of it is cheap and easy because you've already established a pattern for doing that. And the pattern you're following is a very well-known common pattern you can hire new people to do if you need. None of that makes the problem I'm aspiring to get to that you have, you've had in the past go away, but it makes it easier to mitigate the risks, I think, and manage costs, hopefully. I wish we had another hour, but unfortunately it's lunchtime. Um, that was a joke. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you know, we'll just keep going. Yeah, very, <laughs> very. So uh, uh, at one o'clock, they're gonna do the awards in this room, so please come back for that. Um, if you want to continue this conversation, just please Google my name and get a hold of me. We'll figure out how to do that. I think this was really great. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you for all your great questions.